Well, I want to welcome each and every one of you back to a series that we've been in this summer. It's been a special type of series. We have a resource. We've been talking about having a summer of foundations, and it comes from a story that Jesus told about two houses, one house built on the rock, the other house built on the sand, and then Jesus said, when the winds blow, I don't know how long you've uh, been doing this, but it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when the winds blow against your house, what are you building on? And so we've been talking about how to build on the firm foundation of the biblical foundations in Scripture. So we've been taking these foundational themes from Scripture and walking through them one by one. And also, in this series, it's not only about the foundation we receive, but it's been about being equipped because when you see yourself as one who's giving it away, you listen a little bit differently. That you might want to disciple your kids or a friend or someone and help them along the way in their journey. This weekend, I want to welcome our McKinney campus, our Hazlitt campus that's there with us right now, online, all of you, maybe someone watching this message later. Would you put your hands together and welcome everybody joining in? This week's question is, why is the church important? Why is the church important? So this big banner theology, I find a lot of people spend a lot of time studying it or even say, hey, I have these ideas about different areas, but a lot of people even that would say, I have a lot of strong theological beliefs, more times than not, I see in our culture that they haven't been trained in a portion of theology called your ecclesiology. Your ecclesiology, I'm going to show you what that means. That's your study or belief about the church of Jesus Christ, his church. Now, when we think about it, sometimes we think about it in our context. We think about it from our experience. I want to talk to you today, not just from experience, but from the basis of what the word of God says about the church. By the way, the kingdom of God is what Jesus came to establish. He didn't come to establish human kingdoms. He's the ruling and reigning Lord of the kingdom that he is extending throughout the earth. And so the church of Jesus Christ is the vehicle in which he uses to extend his kingdom. The Bible uses other pictures, the body of Christ, that there's this body that's moving throughout the earth when it's connected together, not just kind of here, not just parts laying there, but when it's connected, then it moves throughout the earth and it gives a picture of Christ. Ephesians says when we grow up into maturity, people see Jesus. I want to encourage you with something. You are not the church. You by yourself cannot display everything that Christ is, though there's an individual dimension to our relationship with God and a personal responsibility to share Christ with others. There's no better picture of Jesus Christ than when his church comes together and shows the fullness of who he is. It's the body of Christ. It's the bride of Christ. I'm really more of a lover than I am a fighter. I know I look bald and tough like a wrestler or something. But I'm really more of a lover, but if you talk about my bride, we're going to have issues. So talking about my wife, just be careful in our critical culture that you're not talking bad about Jesus' wife, lest he get a little upset with you. It's his wife. It's his bride. It's the family of God. By the way, the New Testament uses all this familial language, brothers and sisters and spiritual moms and dads and relationships. There's this familial picture that we see. So I want to walk through a little bit of a question asking time, and we've done that every week. What is it? And, and I want to end with like, so what? Why, why does it matter? Why, why, why is it important that we have a good ecclesiology, a good understanding of the church? Because it'll affect your personal life, and it is Jesus' plan. He doesn't have a plan B. I do want you to know that when I preach on the subject, the church, I, I, I understand I have some biases. I do. I have some biases. Uh, my, my mom, my parents were first generation Christians. My mom went down the street to a little church in BBS and accepted Christ. It changed my life. I don't even know where my life would be today without that little church that no one's ever heard of that wasn't trending on Twitter. But they were preaching the gospel and my mom accepted Jesus and my dad accepted Jesus and I went to a little church in East Texas that you've never heard of. It wasn't a perfect, perfect church. Because there's no perfect church. It's all filled with imperfect people. But man, that church, there was, the gospel was preached. 
And at 12 years old, I accepted Christ. And I like to say it took. I accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior like we're celebrating at all these campuses. And not long after that, six months later, I'd never heard of this or really seen this. This was not something I was mimicking. My dad was an engineer. He wasn't a pastor. In fact, I love to tell that story. My mom was a prayer warrior. How many of y'all thankful for the moms and grandmas that prayed for us and held this thing together when men were both mostly absent from the church? That's what I love about our church is you men in our church that are bringing your family and you're coming and you're serving God because you're a game changer. But I thank God for the moms. In fact, before my dad went to church, my mom took me to church. My dad was like, don't take my son down there and mess him up with them crazy people. You know you've thought it. But my mom was a prayer warrior. And six months after accepting Christ, I was in my room. I had this encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I felt like God was calling me into ministry. I walked out into our family room. I had big crocodile tears. I said, Mom, Dad, I think I'm called to ministry. My mom said, thank you, Jesus. I knew it. My dad said, sit down, boy, we're going to diagram this and figure out how you're going to pay your bills. <laughs> About six months later, I went and told my grandma. I said, Grandma, I'm going into the ministry. She said, oh, my God, you could have been an attorney. You could have done a whole so many great things with your life. You're going to do this. I, I realize I'm a little biased because I started early. Why do we have a church filled with young people? On Labor Day weekend, you need to come and watch their gifts the reason is when I tell them you don't have to wait to be great, they believe it because my pastor let me preach at 16 years old in my home church. I grew up being a part of what God was doing. Went to Baylor University. That's Jerusalem on the Brazos if y'all don't know where it is. God's presence dwells there in tangible form. And while I was in college, I started serving as a youth pastor at a little local church. The pastor left to get a master's degree in history. They voted me in as the head guy. They told me, here's your title, temporary interim. <laughs> I was really pumped that I was in charge till I realized they were emphasizing temporary and interim mean the same thing. Don't get settled in, bro. This is really short term for you. <laughs> Most Sundays I felt inadequate. I was like, I don't know if I can lead these people. There were people in our church that walked the earth with Moses. They were there when he was there. I mean, they were at the burning bush. And, and they... <laughs> They were like, I don't think we can follow you. And I thought, I don't think I would follow me, actually. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's all I've ever done. I think it's important for you to understand, too. You're like, well, yeah, I mean, milestone and all these nice things. Not that we've always had nice buildings or different things along the way. I've pastored churches in multiple different places. Little church, Central Texas. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors. There were five mad Baptists up in there. I pastored in a phone company, in a furniture store, in cafetoriums, different size churches, all of those being different expressions. And you're like, well, I've had some problems in the church. Join the crowd. I have too. Some of my most painful moments and my greatest joys have been as a result of the church. But I don't base my theology on my experience. I base it on the word of God. By the way, the most common reason people disconnect from church, we have all kind of ideas and people online that have all these comments, but I'll tell you, the number one reason people leave church is their own personal problems. A divorce, an illness, a health situation, a challenge, a conflict, most of the time it's a life disruption. Can I give you some encouraging news about what brings them back statistically? The number one thing that gets a person, where are the Smiths? Well, they're going through something. Is someone that's a friend to them that helps them get back connected in their faith. I want you to look with me at Matthew chapter 16. I want to start by making sure that we establish it's not my opinion that Jesus is building his church. It's not, we have to first establish, is this primary? Is this plan A, you said? How do we know that? Well, Matthew 16, Jesus is with his disciples. And he goes to this place called Caesarea Philippi. I've taken groups there. It's a very beautiful place now. It's at the headwaters of the Jordan. And at that time, though, it was a place in culture that was known to be the darkest. There were pagan festivals, there were idol worship, there were human sacrifices, literally. And so for a devout Jew to go there was like, hey, whoa, whoa, Jesus takes them to the darkest, most scary place that he can take them. And this place that they were at, at the headwaters of the Jordan, was called the gates of hell. 
Jesus goes there and stands at the gates of hell, this dark place, dark place in culture, and he says, who do people say that I am? He's not so much concerned with what people say about who he is. He asks them, but what about you? My disciples, what do you say? He asks, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter asked, you're the Messiah, you're the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father who's in heaven. The fact of the matter is, following Jesus is not a cerebral exercise. It's not a philosophical ideology. It's not signing up for an institutional ideology that you now adhere to. It comes by revelation from God himself. And so this revelation that came to Peter, he says, look, it it came to you by revelation. I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock of revelation, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades cannot overcome it. He said, I will build my church. What's Jesus doing right now? We get sidetracked. The reason I meet so many frustrated people today is that they think there's another solution of some sort and they get really frustrated because we try to go around Jesus' plan. He's not leading the heavenly choir. he's, He's not up there wringing his hands wondering what's going on in the world. If he said, I'll build my church, he hasn't ever told us that he stopped. So the church is not peripheral. It's not a group of codependent people eating potluck. It is the vehicle in which he extends his kingdom in the earth. I will build my church. That's what he said. By the way, I I, I listen some to people today because I I have a fair amount of interaction with people that are hurt or discouraged, and it's okay. That's what pastors do. But I always am continually trying to help people get a perspective. Many times we look at the church through our perspective, but we don't go all the way back to Jesus' perspective, and a lot of times you haven't had an ability to know the history of the church. The history of the church is we've had some great moments and some bad moments. We've had some down times. We've had some dark times. Because we're flawed, broken people, we've missed it a few times in church history. But make no mistake, the church of Jesus Christ is still alive. It's still here. It's still extending his grace in the earth despite all the challenges. Blockbuster's not. Be kind, rewind. I found out Toys R Us. Toys, I want to be a Toys R Us kid. Yes, sir. It's not here anymore. But until Jesus splits the clouds to come and redeem his bride, the church of the living God will continue to exist on the earth. Because he said, I will build my church. Now, you can look at Peter and be like, wow, that's this revelatory moment. And Peter, and man, you know, like, can I relate to that? He had this revelation. Well, Peter, he makes some mistakes. He ends up betraying Jesus. Jesus dies on the cross, raises from the dead, pours out his spirit on everyday people first time, and then Peter preaches this message and thousands of people get saved, and then it says he was, that, that God was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. And then Peter starts building the church and these apostles and others, and the, the, the majority of the New Testament, by the way, if you have a bad ecclesiology, which means your belief or study of the church, it's hard to read the New Testament, because it's letters to churches. And most of the exhortation on the pages are teaching us how to get along, teaching us how to get over ourselves. And so Peter, later in life, he doesn't abandon it. This is decades later from what I just read to you. He says, as you come to him, the living stone, make no mistake, being a part of a great church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. There's a vertical relationship. He says, you've got to come to the living stone on your own, outside of any horizontal relationship. You come to him rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also like living stones. I love this. Not bricks, stones that are individual and hone out of the rock. They're hewn out. They're individual, but they're alive. Look at the metaphor or picture are being built into a spiritual house. So when we, as our individual natures and the way God designed us, when we come and we're being placed together, there's this spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices, the presence of God begins to fill that structure acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It's where he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. There's a difference in the way God, he's everywhere, there's nowhere that he's not, but there's a way he's somewhere in a distinct way among his people. 
The church has faced multiple challenges along the way, but we have to ask this question, why is the church important? Why is it important? Well, we have to start with what is it? What is it? You've heard me say ecclesiology, the Greek word ecclesia. The word means, this is important, the called out assembly. So I have worshiped, by the way, I've pastored four different churches and four different places and four different demographics. Four, I, I've, I've been in multiple different places and, and, and the called out assembly look different in different regions. I've worshiped with the underground church in China. I've worshiped with the church in Africa. It's an amazing thing to realize that there are these people who have some different uh, things they do stylistically or culturally, but yet they worship the same Jesus. It's the called out assembly. It's also a congregation that comes together. I heard a guy the other day on a deal was talking about the outdoors. He had this emotional moment. He was looking at the outdoors. He said, the woods are my church. Sounds so profound as he looked into the camera. Now, I love the woods. I love the water. I wish the woods and the water could be my church, lest I wouldn't be here with you this weekend. So, man, I love it. But you in the woods or you on the golf course, you're not the church. Now, if you want to go to the woods, build a fire, and gather some folk and become a congregation, then y'all can be the first woods church of Keller. But you are not the church. It's the assembly. It's the called out. Different forms and different styles. But the church is bigger than buildings. It's people. But there's also a structure, by the way, too. Because there's some things we do. There's, a, there's, a, there's also, yes, it is this, this connection and this relationship and this assembly, but, but there's also some things that we've been mandated by God to do as well. But there's an assembly. Let us consider how we must spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. We went through a challenging time in recent years. There were all these prognosticators that said the church will never again be the same. We will now have online church. We will never gather. We will not. I, I'm like, hey, I'm going with the word. Not talking about whether there wasn't time or that people weren't sick. And I was gracious to people. It's like I used to tell people during that time. I'm like, if you are out of assembling because of health, we are praying for you. But if you are not assembling because of habit, we're also praying for you that you might read Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Because there's a assembling together because what happens when we come together, we have to spur one another on to good works. Now, that is what is it in terms of what Jesus has defined it as and the scripture defines it as, but I love to talk about too the culture of it. Because culture eats strategy for breakfast, there's an environment. And by the way, don't get trapped in today's thinking. A lot of people are like, well, you know, like a church gets big or a church is small, and those are relative terms. Did you know there, I can take you to a church that's very small, that's not friendly, that's not connected, that's not healthy. By the way, we, we, we here at Milestone, we don't believe we're the only church. We don't believe we're the special church. We're not the, the center of the church universe. I mean, we love our family. I mean, I got a little brother. He's going to be a year old, Samuel, my grandson. I got pictures in my phone, and I'm a little partial to him over your grandkids. In fact, we're going to have his one-year-old birthday. It'll be amazing. They'll get him a cake. He'll be eating. His mom will be like, look, first time he ever had sugar. I'm like, not true. <laughs> he had a popsicle with Papa yesterday. Come on, somebody. <laughs> it's okay to love your family, but we have to know we're not the only family. And here at Milestone, we help all kinds of churches, churches in our city, churches in multiple places. But don't get trapped in thinking small, big, large style it's all about the environment. And you say, well, what is the culture supposed to look like? I've never shared this on a weekend, but I've shared it with my team. I've shared it with other leaders. Like, I see two pictures in the scripture of the culture environment. I gave them to you. The first one is family. Family is that warm place that you want to come home to. Now, now again, we, we get a little critical that church has problems. And I always like to ask people, does your family have any problems? I, I mean... We can't get along with the people that we are supposed to get along with, much less anyway. Like if people are present, you're going to have some challenges, but no matter what type of family you came from, 
If you had a troubled family, I bet you knew somebody that had some semblance of health, and you're like, can I go spend the night at their house? And the reality is, no matter how much pain we have in family, we never stop desiring it. We never stop wanting it. And people here call Milestone, well, it's friendly. It's more like, come on home to family. But family is this culture of love and acceptance and environment where we prefer one another and we, we reciprocate. But body is also part of it too. The knee bone is connected to the shin bone. Shin bone's connected to the foot bone. Like, it's not just a blob. It's not just a mass listening to someone download content. It's a connected set of relationships that have intentionality, like your body. And your body can move. It can function when it's connected. Bible addresses it. I don't know if you've read those verses. Well, I don't need the eye. I don't need... Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't just start throwing them out. Like, we, we got to be able to see. we got to be able to do this. Just because it's not your body part, don't despise those who have that body part. So there's this connection of that ethos. Anybody love a, Venn, a good Venn diagram? Anybody? When you have that meshing, you have that cultural backdrop of love and acceptance, but we also are not just sitting around singing kumbaya, wondering what we're supposed to do. We are invading hell. We believe heaven and hell are real places. We believe that it matters what we do, so we have a functionality as well. By the way, if a church, by the way, you can use this in your home, if it only has family, then it can create a, an environment of enablement. Well, hey, we just love, but we're, you know, we just let you stay in your dysfunction. If a church is only functional, do this, do this, then it can become a performance environment. Jesus was full of mercy and grace and truth. It's both and. It's both and. You say, what is important about this in our own lives? Well, when you talk about family, you should ask yourself, am I planted where God has placed me? Because we don't vote on this. We don't join the church. We're placed by him. He sets the lonely in family. He sets us as members of his body. You can join Costco, which I like, because when I go there with my wife, I, I start out hungry, but by the time I make a few laps around the place, I'm full. It's amazing. Put on a disguise. What do you have? Oh, nice. Beanie weenies, you know. <laughs> but we think that's how we become part of the church. Like, I'll give that a seven, the music a five. I'll look at all this. Whoa, 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 whoa. While you're evaluating, the most important evaluation is, God, where have you planted me? Where have you placed me? And when you know that, then you get planted in family. And then when it comes to the body, am I using my gifts? Because the body's not complete if we don't offer the peace that we have. Every week I've showed you the two houses. Here's some sand-based thinking that I hear people say. The church is a building. The church is a building or the church is service that I go to. No, actually the church is the people of God. It's the environment. Now, I want to say this. I thank God that as we've progressed along, people have been generous. And, and it's nice to have a building that works with you. Again, I've been in grocery stores and cafetoriums and phone companies. It's nice to have something that helps. I'm, we have campuses in schools. We have a little uh, church building in McKinney. We have different places, people worshiping in different ways. But I want to tell you that a building is helpful in serving people, but it is not the church. The church is the people of God. And if all the buildings are removed, you can't stop the people of God from gathering and worshiping their Jesus underneath the headship of who he is. And so the church is not a building. I don't need church to go to heaven. I hear people all the time, well, I don't need church. The woods are my church. I don't need church to go to heaven. Well, the technical statement is true. You don't need anything to go to heaven other than submitting your life to Jesus Christ. But once you submit your life to that Jesus and you begin to study what the Jesus is into and you see him say, I came to seek and save that, is, that, that which is lost, and then you start seeing what happened in the book of Acts and then you start reading your New Testament and you get close to that Jesus, you're going to find out that you can't exempt yourself. So, so you have a Jesus you've made up in your own mind. But because heaven is real, the church is actually vital because this isn't even about me. And so, yes, I don't need the church to go to heaven, but to bring heaven to earth, I have to be a part of an assembly, a congregation, a group of called out ones. I choose the church that I like. Actually, I just address that. God places us in family and body. One day I'll get committed. One day I'll commit. No, 
the reality is if you want the best for those that you love and the best for your own life, our family prioritizes church engagement. A lot of people today, because we live in a content distribution world, they think church is watching a few talented people do amazing things. No, actually, there's a few that God calls, but their job is to equip you to walk out what God's called you to do. I've, I started talking about this several years ago that I read, and I'm going to show it to you in a minute, out of Ephesians that we're an everyone church. I, I didn't want to be a superstar. I want to be a super coach, a super dad, a super pastor where I'm equipping more people to do what God's called them to do. So what? You're like, what? this is the theological backdrop, but where does the rubber meet the road in my real life? Number one, the church is important today because it is God's answer for loneliness. We're hardwired by God to belong. You're like, loneliness? We live today in the most individualized world in the history of the world. Most individualistic world, most self-preference world that's ever been. Now again, empires have fallen, different things have happened, and the church has marched on. But one of the things that's an epidemic in our world, the social construct of counselors and sociologists, calling it literally an epidemic of loneliness. Like in fact, it's so challenging, parents today, one of their number one requests of us is help my kids learn how to make friends. Parents are having to go to college to say, hey, can you do something because we buffered their life and never taught them how to get along with people. If you allow your family, yourself, to live a life where the planets rotate around you, you are not setting your children or yourself up to be good with natural family, much less spiritual family. Because selfishness is toxic. It's toxic. One another's. There's a hundred times one another is mentioned in the New Testament, over and over. In fact, most of those, by the way, are actually commands, not suggestions. Love one another, serve one another, forgive one another, bear one another's burdens. You can't live the New Testament if you're not connected to the one another's. You can have your own version of Christianity, but you can't have a biblical version. We live in an individualized technological world that's highly mobile, that causes us to chase after different things and leave our, our social constructs. And so today we have people that are acquaintances and we go into our houses and shut our garage with all our technology and our personal preferences that we stream, but we don't have fulfilling lives. Did you know winning in life at the end of your days when you're on your deathbed, let me tell you what you won't be talking about your 401k or the latest movie that you binged. You're going to be talking about people in your life, relationships. That's why he sets the lonely in families, loneliness in our world. Here's the second one. It's how we grow. It's how we grow. One another's. Ephesians 4.16 says, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament. I love this. When all of it's connected, it says it grows and it builds itself up in love. So if it's healthy, then it's growing. God determines the increase in the growth. That's up to God. He does it. We, some plant, others water. God causes the increase. That's up to God. So what's big, what's small, we try to define it. Who knows? The point is it's growing, but if it's healthily growing under the headship of Christ, connected, then it should have more love for a world that's starving for the love of God. Builds itself up in love. So you start growing as you get connected, because then you got to do those one another's. In my own mind, I'm the most humble person I've ever met. Come on. Maybe later services there'll be, or maybe at a campus there's some heathen peoples that'll be honest in church. I said, in my own mind, I'm the most humble person that I've ever met. Reality is, I live in a family. Routinely before church, I always love to tell this story. I'd still do it. I have a big mirror in my bedroom, and so I got my Bible and my notes, and I start preaching. Praise God, glory. You are a powerful bishop, bald bishop. You will bring the word today. I'm just building myself up in the Lord, you know. A little five foot four woman come by, say, Hey, bald bishop, you left your underwear on the bathroom floor. 
Anybody live in real life? The bishop does not concern himself with such lowly matters. The ground gets real level at the place of family. And I want to say this, there's a lot of people who live an isolated version of Christianity that's only head knowledge that they don't ever put into practice. And if you're isolated and not connected to his church, you're not growing. You're not growing. It's how God made us to grow. We're in everyone church. Notice what else it says. Builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That's this powerful picture of Jesus as everyone brings their part. The Olympics have this ad from Nike, not everyone wins. I mean, not everyone does win because not everybody's willing to do what it takes to win. But, but I notice that in this concept of everyone winning, this is what's so amazing about the church. No matter where you come from, he accepts us like we are, but he turns us into something we never thought we could ever be by his grace and his transformation power. And what's amazing about the church is we can come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnicities, different places, some from the most broken place, some from the highest place that are just as broken. And we can come together all as one. And when we bring our peace, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. People go, no one can make all that happen. This has to be people that have something different in their hearts. And in everyone church, everyone is loved. Everyone is welcomed. And in everyone church, everyone's contribution matters. Do you know your contribution? Do you know your gifts? Are you using it to advance Jesus' agenda in the earth? We all want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. His intent was that now, I love this verse, his intent was that now through the church, not by ourselves, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So it's through his assembled congregants that come from imperfect places who come together, not me alone, I cannot display the manifold wisdom of God, but through the church, the rulers and authorities see something beautiful, the multifaceted character and nature of Christ. Now I want to get very personal for some of you young families. Because as a pastor now, where I'm at in my phase of life, I get concerned with how our culture and our world is, is, is trending. And that is that I see a lot of times today, due to all the available options. By the way, we have so many options today, don't we? I went to Cheesecake Factory the other day. I'm like, I'm overwhelmed. I'll take cheesecake. <laughs> just, it's just like, you got everything... Anyway, so many options, so many places to invest. And as a pastor, not just, and I want to say this, not just Milestone Church, if you're watching online, get planted in whatever church God has you and love it and give your gifts to it, wherever it is. Find that place. You're like, well, I've never been able to find one that meets my standards. Maybe you're the problem. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, I, the, you tell the jokes about the weird uncle and family, and they're like, well, I don't have any weird uncles. That means you are the weird uncle. I mean, that, you're the one they're talking about. It's a common denominator here. Wherever you go, you're there. But this is from a pastor's heart, and this is also from a dad and a granddad's heart. We don't limit the access to it. If we don't limit the access to it, our kids will receive invaluable benefits from the church. I know some of you, you've had some pains, you've had some ups and downs, and you've disconnected, but I find now we have a lot of people who go, well, I was in church, and man, I didn't like Sunday school, my Sunday school teacher was mean, but you got the stories. Or I didn't like the music, but the music had theology in it, and for whatever reason, you disconnect, and now you live sort of an individualized version of Christianity that sort of picks and chooses from the appetizer platter, do not limit your kids' access to the foundational things that they're going to need one day. Yeah. I'm old enough that I have friends now that say, well, my kids don't take their kids to church. You didn't take your kids to church. Don't make that mistake. You're like, but there's all these imperfections. But God uses it anyway. He does stuff in it. There's a foundation that's being received, and our young people need to have the environment that they're getting those foundational things, and they're growing in those principles, and they're learning to get along, and they're learning to be in Sunday school, and they're learning to go to camp, and they're learning to get over their selfishness. There's something God does in it. 
I told you some of my greatest moments and some of my most challenging moments have been through the church, but I thank God for this vehicle that he gave that has deposited so much in my life. My kids, I'm thankful for this church. Not because I'm the pastor. Just know this, just because I'm the pastor, I can't produce what this church gave to my own family. My kids grew up in the youth group. My kids grew up in the camps. My kids chose to go off to college and leave. They, they were in high school. They're like, you live in the suburbs, Dad. You ain't cool. Like, look, I'm fine with my life. Go get out there and do whatever you want to do. Anybody got any teenagers? We're going to do something trendy. Get after it. I'm not, not in any way dissatisfied with what I'm doing. I'll still be here when you get back. It's amazing how they get out there and it's kind of like, whoa, Dad, we're coming back. It ain't all that bad. We've had some recent impact in the life of our church. I want to pray for you after this. This is the stuff that happens in church. Not because people are perfect, but because people are willing to offer what they have. This is just the last two weeks. We just had, there's so many, I can't do enough videos to tell you all the lives that are being impacted as a result of us just coming together and getting over offenses and loving each other and making Jesus the most important thing. We had Freedom Weekend, 350 participants. How many of y'all were a part of Freedom Weekend? Any campus, raise your hand. Amazing. 218 volunteers. Thank you to all of the volunteers. Did you know there were people all weekend just prayed for the participants, showed up, gave their whole weekend up just to pray? That's amazing. And I heard one story that I had to tell you. They told me this story. There's a guy named Clint who came to, to Freedom Weekend a few years ago to deliver Jason's deli sandwiches. He wasn't here for the participation, but he's delivering sandwiches. And out in the commons, he's watching the video screen, and he gets impacted. Just delivering sandwiches. That's the power of the gospel. He gave his life to Christ. He went through freedom himself. He went through the grow track himself. Yeah. Yeah. He went through all of it. Get this now. Been serving. This year he said, I'm going to step out. I'm going to get on the ministry team. Clint gets on the ministry team. This weekend, the first guy that comes down. Now, part of his story was he was separated from his wife and had a, a challenge in his marriage. And he's there on the ministry team. There's no coincidences in God. The first guy that comes down says, I'm struggling in my marriage. He's like, that's what God does in his church. I showed you the video last week of food insecurity. I didn't even know this was an issue, but because you are a generous church and you're an activated church, and we're not just a blob, but we're connected, we can address issues in our community. And we started out with just a few Title I schools. I'm thinking, food, we can, hand, we can do that. I didn't even realize it was an issue. And this, this video I showed you uh, last weekend is, is such a beautiful picture of two locations, pounds and pounds of food, that we invited all 11 Title I schools to receive from that, and thousands of people were impacted. Our youth camp, 600 students, 129 volunteers. Can I say thank you, thank you, every campus, volunteers who took off time from work to go serve teenagers all week long. Can we give a round of applause to those volunteers? Hey, this is not the Ritz Carlton, okay? Are y'all with me? It's hot, no sleep, but we believe the next generation is important. We got to stop yelling at our TVs and being mad about what's going on. We got to start being activated in actually training them in what the Word of God says. Plus, they're going to vote on nursing home laws one day. Come on, everybody. <laughs> we need them final thing is this weekend, there's a hundred people being baptized at all of our campuses and we celebrate with every single one of them because heaven celebrates. I want to pray for you, but I want to give you this phrase. I use it all the time and it's the power. The power of Milestone Church is not a few talented people. It's just a collection of ordinary everyday people that God does something great as they bring themselves together. And this is a phrase that I want you to leave with when you think about the church. No one can do everything but everyone can do something. No one can do everything, but everybody can bring their part. And when we all bring our part, then God gets the glory. I want to pray for you today. Everyone bow your heads wherever you're listening to me from, whatever campus you're at. First of all, I'm talking about the church, but the church is just the vehicle. Jesus is the head. Jesus is when he wants to have a personal relationship with you. Jesus is the message, the person, 
He's the Savior. He's the Lord. And right where you are, if you say, I've not committed my life to Christ, maybe you're watching these baptisms and you're like, I've never really surrendered to Christ. Well, you can believe that he died on the cross. That's the death. And in the baptismal waters where you see the burial, that's he was buried, but he was raised on the third day. As they come back up from the water, it's a picture of what Jesus did. Jesus, you can just say, Jesus, come into my life. I believe you died on the cross, rose from the dead. I accept you today as my personal Lord and Savior. If you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to let us know so that we can help you start your journey and help you take steps along the way. Second of all, Lord, I pray right now, if there's one person not planted, not placed, doesn't know their gifts, doesn't know their, that, Lord, you, you made them in their mother's womb. You, you planted in them gifts and abilities and talents. I pray, Lord, that they would discover them, that they would use them for your purposes. Lord, we pray for the church, the church in this hour where there's a world that needs the church around the world to be built up, built up in love so that a lost and hurting and dying world can see your grace and your truth, Jesus. Lord, we also pray for our church, Lord, that we would get over offenses, that we would walk in unity, that we would, we would be the church every single day. Lord, we ask for your grace to do it in Jesus' name. Amen.